Hi everyone, today we're going to talk about the gradient, divergence, and curl of scalar vector and tensor fields. <coughs> I suppose there isn't divergence of a scalar field, but the rest of them. <coughs> Last time we'd introduced the notion of differentiation and the Fréchet derivative, which is going to relate to, and in fact be identified with, the gradient. Um, after today, there will be one more short lecture on differentiation. We'll talk about differentiation of a scalar function of a tensor variable, <coughs> which will come in handy for constitutive theory, since that would be like how you talk about the strain energy due to a strain. Um, but that'll be next lesson. And then after that, we'll do probably just one lecture on integration and integral theorems, and it'll be on to <coughs> kinematics. All right, so I said gradient divergence and curl of scalar vector and tensor fields. So what does it mean for something to be a scalar vector or tensor field? Got some crap on the screen here. Drive you nuts. At least when you go to wipe stuff off of the blackboard, the blackboard doesn't go anywhere, you know? Here you go to try to wipe a little smudge or piece of crumb off of it, and whoa, whole thing's all over the place. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so let's say we have a region R. Maybe R is a subset or even equal to some Euclidean space, but really R could be any manifold, so locally it might look like Euclidean space, but it might not globally be able to be identified with Euclidean space. Um, the kind of example you should see in your head for, for that is like a, a sphere, you know, the, the surface of a ball. <clears throat> so maybe R is a subset or equal to EN, Euclidean n-dimensional space, <clears throat> but we could have it really be any manifold, I said. <clears throat> A manifold just, again, being something that, you know, has Locally, it looks like Euclidean point space, um, so it has a dimension and everything like that, but it might not be able to be globally identified as such. You might not be able to put, say, X, Y, and Z coordinates on the whole thing in a way that makes their gradients mutually perpendicular and all that stuff. All right, so first, <coughs> a scalar field phi is a function mapping each point of R to a scalar value. So that would be denoted phi of x, for x a point in R. <clears throat> 
um, one thing. So another name for a scalar field would be a zero order tensor field. Some sources will call it that. <clears throat> Okay, and then two, a vector field, you know, again, it's going to map points in R to vectors, but specifically those vectors are vectors that live <clears throat> in the tangent space to R at X. Um, this is really not of any consequence in Euclidean space because Euclidean space has the same tangent space everywhere, so it only has one. But, um, you know, if you're talking about the surface of a ball, then the tangent space at one point really only exists at that point. Um, it doesn't make sense to talk about moving a tangent vector at one point and applying it somewhere else. <clears throat> say each point watch this so it'd be denoted t sub x <clears throat> that's a bad x there we go of R, the tangent space to R at X. <clears throat> um, so like I said, that's simple enough if R is a subset of or equal to Euclidean space, but there's some particulars if it's uh, just generally a manifold. Um, you see other sources <clears throat> say that a vector field is a smooth section of the tangent bundle. So the tangent bundle is the collection of all the tangent spaces. And so all that that is saying is that it's, you know, a, a smooth mapping from R, the underlying region, to its, its tangent space at any given point. So you can identify tangent vectors of close by points. Um, you can say whether they're, you know, varying rapidly or anything like that. Um, you can talk about differentiating them in that sense. And it's only really ones that are not local <clears throat> that can't be identified with one another necessarily. Um, so just keep that in mind. You know, there again, you don't need it for this class because in this class we're talking about Euclidean space. But um, when you deal with interfacial effects and surface tension and stuff, if you go into that, then the distinctions matter. And so then a tensor field maps the points of R to tensors. Oh, well, also a vector field is sometimes called a first-order tensor field. <clears throat> 
Okay, and then three is a tensor field. is again a function mapping each point of r but now it's to the space of linear operators on the tangent space to r at that point that's a, a mouthful right there isn't it So in other words, at a point x, um, t x is <clears throat> in, um, we'll call it lin like that. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right. So that's what a scalar vector, oh yeah, and so you know these would often be called second order tensor field. We in this class have been calling tensors second order tensors, um, but you know other sources will do that. All right, so now onto the gradient. Uh, what is the gradient of a field? We'd introduced the notion of Frechet differentiation in the last lecture. <clears throat> so a function phi mapping a region R to a vector space U, <coughs> you could just be the real numbers, is Frechet differentiable. At X, in R <coughs> if the limit as the magnitude of H goes to zero of phi x plus H minus phi of x plus we'll call it a sub x operating on h over the magnitude of h is equal to zero for some A X <clears throat> in the space of linear functions from 
the tangent space to r at x to uh, do, 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 u. Come back. So h here is a displacement while x is a point. Um, that sort of, you know, this def definition here and the idea that you can add a displacement to a point really only works if we're restricting our view to um, Euclidean space, right? Because if you think of like the velocities that you could have at a point on the sphere, you can't really like add, <clears throat> you know, some delta t times a velocity at a point and end up with something that's still on the surface there um, but hold on for for now and we'll come up with a definition that you know works even in that case um, but this definition of the Frechet derivative is going to be good for uh, for our Euclidean space purposes all right so if phi is a scalar field, then this ax function here takes tangent vectors or, you know, displacements and maps them to a change in a scalar value in a linear way. So they would live, A would be in the, the space that is dual to the tangent space. But because we have an inner product, the, the tangent space, which is a vector space, well, its dual space is itself, right? So in, in that case, the, um, the gradient of a scalar field is a vector field under the action of the inner product. Oopsies. Um, that there <clears throat> should be a minus. This here that I had to change to a minus. I don't know why I wrote it plus to begin with. That's, uh, you know, clearly not correct. Um, also here, this is vector zero in the vector space U. <clears throat> fix that in my paper notes here so that I don't mess it up in the future. All right, so it's the principal linear part of the change in phi going from x to x plus h. So like I said, um, A, X, H is a linear map from a vector space to real numbers. <clears throat> 
when the <coughs> tangent space is an inner product space, which it is here, <coughs> then the Fréché derivative of a scalar field under the action of the inner product is a vector field. So that is, there is a vector field satisfying this. We'll call it a <coughs> G of X satisfying. Phi. <coughs> x plus h minus phi x is equal to g of x dot h plus things that vanish more quickly than h. if uh, phi is differentiable at x. And in that case, the gradient of phi evaluated at x is equal to this g right here that we just defined. <coughs> So we can also have the gradient of a vector field, which will be a tensor field. So we have V X plus H <coughs> minus V of X is equal to some tensor G <coughs> of X plus things that vanish faster than H. <coughs> 
So in that case, the gradient of V is that tensor field G. Um, there is such a thing as the gradient of a tensor field. <clears throat> Stuff with those starts to get kind of messy. Um, so in the textbook, they've managed to do everything without taking the gradient of a tensor field because we really only ever take the curl of a tensor field, which is a tensor field, or the divergence of a tensor field, which is a vector field. And so they can define the curl and the divergence <coughs> of tensor fields based on how they act on vectors, um, which is, you know, it makes things easier for us and them notationally. Um, we don't want to have to <coughs> deal with the gradient of a tensor if we don't have to, or like third order tensors. Um, so that's good. I had mentioned um, before that the Frechet derivative definition of the gradient gets iffy um, when R is a general manifold and not a subset of Euclidean space. <clears throat> A way of looking at the gradient that's going to be applicable even when R is a, a manifold. So, you know, you can't add a tangent vector displacement sort of thing to a point and get another point. The tangent vectors more describe like velocities that you can have at a point as opposed to displacements. Um, <clears throat> in that case, you can think of things in terms of velocities and time derivatives instead of in terms of displacements and changes. We'll say R is not a subset or equal to Euclidean space. <clears throat> um, given a temporally constant field phi, um, then the gradient of phi evaluated at x um, dot v, really acting on, but here if phi is a scalar field, it acts on it through the inner product, um, gives the rate of change in phi, if you move from x with velocity v. <clears throat> so here v is in the tangent space to x at r. <clears throat> so like I said, in this course, because we're going to be talking about Euclidean space, the, um, the distinction doesn't really matter. Uh, but one place it does matter, like I've run into pretty recently, is say you want to do like a one-dimensional nonlinear beam theory, then if you have something like a Timoshenko beam where the beam has a cross-section orientation you know, the, the orientation of the cross-section is a rotation, so a, a member of the orthogonal 
<clears throat> group, which is not a vector space. So, you know, its tangent space is infinitesimal rotations or angular velocities, so that's a vector space. Um, rotation rates, basically. But you can't add a rotation rate times a time, say, to a rotation and get another rotation. It doesn't work that way. Um, <clears throat> you have to use the exponential map. And so that, when you talk about applying the principle of virtual work, which we'll get to later, in order to develop a weak form for the, uh, the, the governing equations, you know, the balance of linear and angular momentum in this case, for developing a finite element method, well then, you know, you really do run into this distinction mattering where you, you really can't add a displacement to the state, but you can think of the rate of work done by a virtual displacement if you think of the virtual displacement as more of a, an admissible velocity. <coughs> so, you know, the, the point there is really, while it's not going to matter in this course, um, you should keep it in the back of your mind, because if you go to do things with this stuff, um, you know, you, you'll run into places where it does matter. It's not like um, fancy math for its own sake. But now back for what we're doing in this class, we'll go back to our Cartesian frame in Euclidean space, which is a pretty convenient place to live if you're trying to do math. And by the way, um, a Cartesian frame means that there are three coordinates, x, y, and z, and a constant orthonormal basis so that, you know, e x is equal to e y is equal to constant and uniform. <clears throat> so when I say constant, I mean temporally constant and uniform, meaning not varying spatially. Um, so that's what we mean by a Cartesian frame is, you know, it's in Euclidean space and we've picked an origin and assigned coordinates to it. And, um, you know, the coordinates relate to an orthonormal basis in terms of their gradient like that. <clears throat> All right, well, if grad phi is a vector field and we have this constant and uniform orthonormal basis, then we can write its components. Then um, grad phi <coughs> is equal to the ith component of grad phi times ei. And we can find the components like grad phi's ith component is equal to grad phi dot EI. <clears throat> well, that's saying that it's the directional derivative of phi in the direction I. <clears throat> 
um, based on how we defined the gradient, right? So that is equal to d phi dxi is the ith component of the gradient of a scalar field. <coughs> Similarly, grad v, the vector field, is equal to grad v, or rather, so grad v is a tensor field if v is a vector field. So the ijth component of that tensor field, ei tensor ej, again, this is for the fixed orthonormal basis. Um, well, we know how to calculate the ijth component of a tensor when we have the fixed orthonormal basis. Grad v ij is equal to ei dot grad v <coughs> acting on ej well that's equal to ei dot d v dx j we'll call it and that is equal to d v i over d x j so the gradient is consistent with what you know <coughs> from undergraduate vector calculus provided we have a Cartesian frame in Euclidean space. Now suppose that phi mapping a region R to real numbers is a temporally constant scalar field. is mapping a region R to real numbers is a scalar field. And suppose that we have a point and we're moving through R with a path defined by the function x of t. So x maps real numbers to points in R. x of t being the location at any time t. 
Then at the point of interest, if we're following the point of interest, the time derivative of the scale or quantity phi can be expressed like this. phi x t, the whole thing, dot, is equal to grad phi. Dot <coughs> x dot of t. Similarly, for a vector field, we have a V X T at is equal to grad v, the tensor field, acting on x dot t, our velocity. <coughs> All right, now on to divergence and curl. The divergence of a vector field is the trace of its gradient. <coughs> this makes sense as an idea since the gradient of a vector field is a tensor field. The divergence of a tensor field is a vector field. And rather than using the gradient of a tensor field, we can define it based on how it operates on constant vectors via the inner product. So we have that a dot divergence of t is equal to the divergence of the vector field t transpose a for every constant vector a. <coughs> The curl of a vector field, um, the textbook defines in one way, and it's a way that works, um, and it's illuminating, but there's kind of two ways of looking at it, <coughs> and one that they don't mention that I think is worth noting. So the curl of a vector field can be defined either the way that the textbook does it, 
which is textbook. So the textbook says that a dot curl v is equal to a cross the skew symmetric tensor inner product tensor grad v for every constant vector a and that's indeed correct um, <clears throat> you can also consider the curl of a vector field as twice the axial vector of the skew symmetric part of its gradient. So that is um, curl v cross u is equal to 2 skew grad v acting on u for all u. <coughs> Um, I guess I like that one a little better in that it's not defining the curl in terms of how it acts on some constant vector field. We're kind of defining it directly in terms of the gradient, which is maybe a little more straightforward to think about. Um, but, you know, either one works, and sometimes one way of looking at it will be more helpful than the other. So it's good to know as many different ways of considering it as possible. The curl of a tensor field can be defined as the tensor field curl of T that behaves like this. curl of T, which is a tensor field acting on A, is equal to <coughs> curl of the vector field T transpose A for every constant vector A. In components relative to a fixed orthonormal basis in a Cartesian coordinate frame, we have that the divergence of V is equal to the trace of grad v <coughs> equals the trace of d v i d x j e i tensor e j is equal to D V I D X J 
pi dot ej is equal to d pi d xj delta ij is equal to d vi dxi <coughs> like you're used to seeing and the divergence of t a tensor the ith component of it is equal to d t i j d x j the ith component of the curl of a vector field is equal to epsilon i j k partial v k partial x j curl t i j is equal to epsilon i p q partial t j q partial x p <coughs> All right, let's, uh, now that we have these coordinate and index notation representation of things, <coughs> let's test my claim that the curl of a vector field is twice the axial vector of the skew symmetric part of its gradient. All right, well, let's say we got curl of V cross U. <coughs> that is equal to epsilon I, J, K times the Jth component of curl V times the Kth component of U. And so that is equal to E I J K epsilon J L M partial V M partial X L times U K. We're gonna do the epsilon delta thing here. Um, and for my own sanity, so I don't mix it up, because I like doing EIJKKLM, <clears throat> we're going to switch J and K everywhere in this expression. Um, they're both dummy indices, so it's fine to do that. You don't have to, but for me, it's a lot easier to think of it that way. Um, all right, so this is equal to I, K, J, K, L, M, partial VM, partial X, L, and now it's U, J. All right, we're almost there. Now in this first epsilon, we're going to swap the j and k, and that'll change the sign of it because we've done an odd permutation. <coughs> All right, well, we know how to do that now, or at least that way of looking at it I know how to do. So that's um, delta, uh, or, yeah, I, L, 
delta j m minus delta i m delta j l partial v m partial x l j <coughs> so that is equal to delta i m delta j l partial v m partial x l u j minus delta i l delta j m same thing All right, so that's going to be equal to partial v i partial x j u j minus partial v j partial x i u j, which is equal to, we'll just group our terms there. the whole thing times uj. Well this here is twice the ijth component of skew so that's pretty cool. <coughs> that's shown it. Equation 320 in the book has some super duper useful product identities that'll come in handy now and especially when we go to like do localization of integrals and apply Stokes's theorem to things. Um, so we'll like abuse my hand and write them all out here because yeah. So these are now for, um, you know, we, we had talked about the definition of the divergence and curl, and they used <coughs> how things act on a spatially constant or a uniform, you know, vector. These are now all for, like, scalar fields that are not necessarily uniform and constant, and you have products of them and vector fields and tensor fields, and you talk about the gradient divergence and curl of them. So let's um, write them all out. There's some that are like pretty well duh, <clears throat> and there's some that like, you know, you could derive them from the components, but these are good results to have handy because you'll end up using them a lot. So let's just uh, go right through them. The gradient of a scalar field times a vector field is equal to the scalar field times the gradient of the vector field plus <coughs> the vector field tensor product, the gradient of the scalar field. <coughs> Probably you never saw it written out that way before because you didn't use direct notation in vector calc, uh, but that's what it is. All right, the gradient of the inner product of two vector fields goes with the transpose of the gradients acting on the other one. And of course it has to be symmetric since the inner product is symmetric. So if you do one thing to one of them, you better do it to the other. All right, the gradient of the cross product of two vector fields. <clears throat> 
that better be anti-symmetric with respect to them since u cross v is equal to minus v cross u. And sure enough, <coughs> it is the second order tensor that skews symmetric u cross times grad v minus v cross times grad u. All right, now on to some divergence identities. The divergence of the product of a scalar field and a vector field is equal to the scalar <coughs> times the divergence of the vector field plus v dot the gradient of the scalar field. divergence of the cross product of two vectors is going to involve the curl and the inner product and it's going to be anti-symmetric with respect to u and v like you know what it does to v had better be minus what it does to u <laughs> so that is equal to v dot curl of u minus u dot curl of v. The divergence of the tensor product of two vectors, so that's the divergence of a tensor field, so it better be a vector field. Is equal to div v <coughs> u. This is an interesting one because it doesn't look exactly the same for u and v, which makes sense if you think about how the divergence of a tensor field goes, plus grad u acting on v. All right, the divergence of T transpose acting on v is equal to T, tensor inner product, grad V, plus V dot div T. So this is like the definition of the divergence of a tensor field, except that now V is not a constant or a uniform vector, but V is itself a non-uniform <coughs> vector field. So that's where this uh, additional term comes from. Div of a scalar field times the tensor field is equal to the scalar times the divergence of the tensor field plus T acting on or times well, acting on the vector grad phi, right? So this is a vector field here. All right, now on to curl. The curl of a scalar field times a vector field. It is equal to the scalar times the curl of the vector field. plus the gradient of the vector field cross, or gradient of the scalar field cross the vector field, curl of the cross product, u cross v, is equal to the divergence of u tensor v minus v tensor u. The curl of U tensor product V, so this is a tensor field, <coughs> is equal to the transpose of grad U V cross, so that's a skew symmetric tensor there, the transpose of that 
Let's move that down a little bit. Hey. All that trouble, and you know, we're just going to get rid of it anyway. There we go. All right, and then plus curl v tensor product u. And then finally, the curl of a scalar multiple of a tensor field. Is equal to the scalar times the curl of the tensor field plus the skew symmetric tensor with axial vector grad phi acting on T like that. All right, yeah, that was a lot of writing. The divergence of the curl of a vector field is zero. We'll call it a twice differentiable vector field since otherwise there can't be a divergence of the curl. So let's prove that div curl v is equal to epsilon i j k d squared. So second partial derivative of the k partial x j and then partial xi. So in other words, we're taking the partial derivative with respect to xi of, don't do that. There we go. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll write that out in full here. Textbook skipped the step, but we'll make it less confusing. So this is the partial with respect to xi. This is the divergence part of epsilon i j k partial v k partial x j. All right, so that's where <clears throat> this comes from. All right, well, if it's twice differentiable, then we can change the order of differentiation here, <coughs> right, since they have to, the result of the second derivative there can't depend on the order of differentiation. Well, then we can swap i and j, since they're both dummy indices, and say epsilon j i k Well, then we can go and permute i and j in the epsilon there. So that's an even 
or an odd rather permutation i j k so in other words we showed that this term epsilon i j k second partial derivative of v k with respect to x j and x i has to equal the opposite of itself which is equal to minus so the divergence of the curl of v is equal to minus the divergence of the curl of v so that can happen um, only if it's equal to zero <clears throat> the laplacian of a scalar or vector field is the divergence of the gradient So we'll say Laplacian of phi is defined as div grad phi. Why are you doing that to me? Laplacian of v is again um, <clears throat> the textbook uses a you know uppercase delta for the Laplacian. I don't really like that because we use deltas for changes in things. So I use this um, Nabla squared deal. Um, you can use either one if you want. Just be consistent. All right, now the Laplacian of a tensor field, they define in terms of how it interacts with constant vectors in their usual fashion for not wanting to do the gradient of a tensor field. So the Laplacian of the tensor field is, again, a tensor field. And it acts on a constant vector like the Laplacian of the tensor field on that vector for all constant vectors A. All right, last uh, half page in notes here. Let's look at the divergence of the curl of a tensor field, the ith component of it. This is one of the exercises in the textbook. This is equal to the partial derivative with respect to xj of epsilon i p q partial t j q partial x p. All right, well, we can move the epsilon out there since its derivative is zero. So this is equal to epsilon i p q yeah partial t j q partial let's use and put a square there is that in my notes Yeah, we're good now. All right, partial x j, partial x p. <clears throat> All right, well, that is equal to epsilon i p q partial with respect to x p. 
of partial t j q partial x j. All right, well, we see that this here is the jqth component of the divergence of t transpose. So that is equal to All right, so that we see the come back the qth component of a vector field <coughs> differentiated with the pth coordinate and this epsilon here. Well, that is the curl of that vector field. So that is equal to curl. So we're looking at the ith component of the curl of the divergence of the transpose of t. All right, so the ith component of that vector field is equal to the ith component of this vector field. So the two must be equal. Divergence curl t is equal to curl the divergence of t transpose. All right, that's it for today. So like I said, we'll have one more short lecture on differentiation of a scalar function of a tensor variable, which will be applicable to, for instance, if you wanted to have the derivative of the free energy with respect to the strain, which we'll need in, you know, elasticity. Um, and then we'll get on to integration and be quickly on to kinematics. Posted the um, homework solutions today and uh, have another homework coming out soon. Um, you probably have noticed that a number of the homework problems are problems out of the textbook. And, you know, the textbook doesn't actually have a solution manual, so I have to work them out just like you do. So, you know, I, I know how long sometimes it takes to do. Um, and that's kind of characteristic of the line of work we're in. Um, so, you know, you just got to truck through the math, and with enough practice you'll get better at it, faster at it and everything. But you know, these still take me like some time to do. It's not like I work out the solutions to the homework in a half hour or something. Um, but that's all right. It's, it's good practice for everyone. And it's the only way to get better at it is to do a whole bunch of it. All right, you guys have a good one. Catch you later.